So hello everyone. My name is Ari Maharaj. Um, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the Outreach and Education Coordinator at the National Eating Disorder Information Center. I'm joined here by my two lovely colleagues, Kelsey and Vanessa, if they wanna unmute and say hi, and if we can start with Kelsey. Hi everyone, um, my name is Kelsey. I am a PhD candidate at Western University. Um, really looking forward to discussing this research over the next hour with you. And then Vanessa. Hi everyone, I'm Vanessa and I'm in my first few months of my master's at Western and I'm really excited to be here with you all today. Cool. Over the course of our day today, um, we're gonna to be talking about fostering positive body image and preventing disordered eating in girls in youth sport. Um, and we're excited to talk to you about this throughout our webinar. Just before we, we get going any further, um, really wanna introduce you to the folks behind the project. Um, so there's the Body Image and Health Research Lab at the School of Kinesiology at Western University in London, Ontario, directed by Dr. Ava Kila. Um, their research really focuses on understanding body image and body inequity as it relates to movement, mental health, and well-being. And they integrate multiple frameworks, including from health, exercise, social, and clinical psychology, to understand those conditions that disproportionately impact folks in marginalized states. So we're really glad to have um, their participation in the ways in which um, Kelsey and Vanessa are there from there too. We also have the Mental Health and Physical Activity Research Center, MPARC. Um, they're a multidisciplinary research environment at the University of Toronto, dedicated to evaluating interventions to promote physical activity and mental health among people at risk of inactivity and mental health problems. And they're directed by Dr. Kathleen Sabiston. Um, the research focus includes the influence of motivation, self-conscious emotion, stress, affect, and social support on physical activity, youth and adolescent sport involvement, and emotional well-being. And finally, um, the National Eating Disorder Information Center. We're a nonprofit based out of the University Health Network in Toronto, Ontario, founded in 1985. We operate a national English-speaking toll-free telephone helpline and an online web chat service on netting.ca um, that's anonymous and confidential and self-referral, all for people who um, struggle with this issue, no diagnosis needed. And so over the course of our history, we've talked to thousands of, of athletes, um, of young people engaged in sport, of people who are sport stakeholders like coaches and parents and volunteers um, around supporting people engaged with this issue. And um, we're excited to partner on something that's gonna be a bit more proactive that we're gonna be talking about today. We operate a searchable online directory of 700 plus treatment and support providers across the country. And we get to offer prevention work, um, whether that's through resources or training or through health promotion campaigns, such as Eating Disorders Awareness Week from February 1st to 7th every year. And so without, without us getting further into this conversation, um, I'd really like to offer uh, virtual land acknowledgement and the ways in which I've learned um, from First Nations elders on ways to facilitate this is to always personalize it. And I think the ways in which sport um, was used to also further Canada and the nation building of Canada, I think has a really long and intricate history. Um, and even our conversations about health are correlated with many factors. And for many experiences of racism and settler colonialism can have powerfully negative impacts on those health experiences that people have had. I think in all of us, our mission involves supporting people in health, whatever that looks like for their situation. And so we must consider those social factors that can deny people's health. Um, my heart is especially with indigenous land defenders in the territory known as unceded territory known as British Columbia um, at this moment in the ways in which they're trying to um, avoid disaster and um, really support the climate emergency that we have across the country. Um, and I think it's something that's really important given the intersections with exercise and movement and sport as a way to connect and bring people together um, in the ways we talk about our conversation today. Um, I encourage all of you and many have done so in the chat already, if you know where you're tuning in from and whose land you're on, if you don't mind saying, hi, I'm so-and-so and I'm from a certain, um, certain land. I know I'm tuning in from Treaty 13 territory. It's covered within the dish with one spoon, Wampum Covenant Belt, um, a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas and Haudenosaunee to 
share and respect and take care of the land here. Um, and it's something I know I'm really committed to. So without further ado, we're going to talk about um, our goals today and participation. Um, I see many folks already into the chat and so you're always free throughout to use chat. Um, I'm gonna be there for most of the presentation, can answer your questions and also can bring them up to Kelsey and Vanessa as we speak today. Um, there are also gonna be some times that you might feel like you want to say something out loud. And so if you feel like doing that, if you hit that unmute button or that raise hand button in Zoom, you're free to do that. Just know that this webinar is being recorded. So if you do um, show up on video um, or you do um, unmute and use your voice, that those, those things are gonna be captured on the recording as well. So please keep that in mind um, as you participate today. Our goals is to help you learn about the work underway, to build tools for coaches, peer athletes, and sport organizations to foster positive body image and prevent disordered eating. We're really going to focus our attention on reviewing the results collected from our scoping review and from our focus groups, groups with sports stakeholders across Canada, many of which um, I feel like are represented here today. Um, we're going to provide some insight or look to you to provide some insight on key questions still remaining. And we'll show you where this work is going to be housed going forward. Um, we've created a new website hub where you can sign up to learn more and follow this work as it develops further. And I really want to thank. Um, Kelsey, Vanessa, and Dr. Pila for all of their work on supporting, um, supporting this going forward. So I'm going to pause here and see if anyone has any questions about participation without before turning it over to Vanessa. Okay. And I'm going to turn it over to Vanessa. Awesome. Thank you, Ari. So why we are here creating this Athletes and Body program, the next few slides will outline some research that has been done over the past few years, which shows a need for focus on body image and eating disorder prevention. So as you can see here, 23 to 25% of youth ages 12 to 24, presenting across clinical and non-clinical service sectors, report disordered eating symptoms like binge eating and weight control behaviors. 2.2% of boys and 4.5% of girls in a large adolescent sample met DSM-5 criteria for an eating disorder. In case you aren't aware, the DSM-5 is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And a very recent study saw that girls as young as five prefer dolls with a thinner physique, as well as being teased about your appearance is the most common form of bullying in childhood and in the workforce. Seeing this preference for a thin physique ideal at such a young age presents an even greater social risk for increasing body image issues as these children grow up, hence the need to intervene before body image issues turn into negative eating attitudes at a young age. So more specifically looking into why we are here with all you sport lovers is because sport has a range of benefits, including physical health, leadership, socialization, and mental health. However, the latest research continues to show that most girls are not realizing these benefits. Nearly 60% of girls aren't meeting recommended exercise guidelines and in Canada, nearly 62% of girls are not playing sport at all. By age 14, girls appear to be dropping out of sport at two times the rate of boys. And reports of sport quality suggest that a significant factor that prevents girls from continuing in sport is due to negative body image and the body pressures faced when in the sport environment. In a recent research report, 43% of adolescent girls said the quality of sport was a barrier and every one in three of these girls reported low confidence, negative body image, and poor, percep poor perceptions of belonging and feeling unwelcome as specific barriers in sport participation. As we turn our attention to disordered eating, I'd like to give everyone a chance to read over this slide and really reflect on some of the thoughts and feelings that are listed here and some of the behaviors. And I think, at least on my end, some of the ways in which this is really normalized in the sport environment. Um, this slide demonstrates nine prevalent components of disordered eating as identified by doctors Michael Levine and Linda Smolak in their new edition of Handbook on the prevention of eating problems. And they really argue that it's important, that useful, it's important and useful to think of disordered eating as encompassing this list of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Sometimes it's not all of them together. Sometimes it's one or two. Sometimes it's 
these different amounts and different varieties, but I think it's really important for us to be conscious of it. So I'm gonna give you a minute to, to do that and feel free to ask any questions in the chat if you don't understand any of the terms used here or if you have questions or a comment about what you're noticing as you reflect on this list. Someone's just confidentially messaged me to say that they've they've seen things like this um, and they felt things like this. Someone else is saying they hear this all the time at their kids' sport activities. I guess some of those unrealistic standards coming up, eh? Um, I think what's really important to consider is that sometimes the things that we label as disordered eating, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors can sometimes be really normal responses to disordered situations. And the systems in which we're um, putting potential young people at risk is something that's gonna be a real focus of today and was a real trend of what came up in our focus group consultations for all of you. Someone's asking, were there any findings related to the opposite of being too thin and wanting to be more muscular? Um, for sure, I don't think necessarily that I think we used to focus a lot about um, a pursuit of thinness. And I really wanna drive everyone's attention to that word right next to it and leanness, because I think that muscularity related disordered eating is starting to emerge. And especially as we broaden this conversation to include folks of all genders, um, a lot of men or, or male presenting folks often find that pressure around muscularity. Um, our conversation today and Athletes Embodied that we're gonna be talking to about the initiative is really gonna focus in on on young girls, just given how much this impacts them from a population health perspective. But I think when we're thinking about disordered eating as a societal issue, um, it's really that, that perfectionism as it relates to your body and the ways in which uh, that can manifest can look different for different folks. Um, and yeah, Dr. Gardner is noting maybe any form of sculpting or manipulating the form as ways to think about this. Other folks are noting as well, like worked in the gym and I saw excessive exercising to stay thin. Um, sometimes even when we talk about eating disorders, we like think about compensatory behaviors, often like purging behaviors. We think about the throwing up or vomiting of food. And we don't often talk about the ways in which movement can show up as a compensatory behavior. Exercise is both wonderful for someone's mental health and I'm really mindful when it's someone's only form of coping or when someone is using movement beyond pain, beyond injury and illness, and feeling like they're really rigid in what their movement has to be. And that's where I really want you to think about that. That body checking and engaging in body-based social comparison at the bottom of that slide is something that I think we'll, we'll note a fair bit. Jumping to what causes an eating disorder. Um, they're complicated and there's a variety of contributing risk factors. Um, the development of an eating disorder can't really be traced back to like one biological or genetic factor. Not everyone with an eating disorder is motivated by a need to be thin or to look a certain way. And an eating disorder is just not a dieting attempt that's gone wrong or gone off the rails. Um, there is some complex genetic risk here that's there biologically. Um, and there are also psychological traits that some kids sometimes co-occur as the result of it. Um, perfectionism being a personality trait as one that like proneness to be black or white as a thinker, um, being able, unable to maybe name your emotions or cope with your emotions in a way that um, isn't maladaptive, sometimes having concurrent mental health issues, um, all of those things are things that contribute. And then I think the place that we talk about the most is that sociocultural risk, right? The, the cultural um, necessities that we hear around, like there are certain ways of eating that are most healthy or certain body types that are most healthy. And many people have been immersed in this culture without developing an eating disorder because they don't have that biological and psychological risk. But for those who are at risk, 
that sociocultural risk can really hurt them um, to a place where those appearance standards become sticking points to the ways in which they're receiving comments on social media, to facing discrimination or oppression based on the color of their skin or the way in which people are talking about bodies or the way in which society is being designed to exclude certain bodies. Um, all of those can come in. This biopsychosocial model can sometimes be useful for understanding how and why eating disorders develop because it considers the connection between mind, body, and the environment. And it emphasizes the importance of understanding health and illness in their fullest contexts. Um, these interact, and so it can sometimes be really, really complex. I see a question in the chat that's about movement, so I'm gonna present this slide on it too. Um, in that sociocultural risk, I'd like everyone to recognize the ways in which our talk around exercise and movement sometimes can be steeped in diet culture type messaging. And for me, what that means is the messages that we need to move our bodies in certain ways or in a certain amount to be healthy. And healthy and like small or lean are used interchangeably. And sometimes people go into physical activity experiences at, with a primary motivation of maybe we need to make our bodies smaller or leaner and therefore supposedly healthier. It's about that pursuit and that chase. Um, but being in a smaller body does not make a person healthier and being in a larger body does not make a person less healthy inherently. Um, there are a lot more complexities and determinants of health and movement is full of so many positives that have nothing to do with weight or appearance. And so, um, it's really important to keep those things in mind. And we're gonna talk about that throughout today. Um, to the question in the chat, um, someone's asking, does the research distinguish in any way between cultures of sport that may cause these behaviors versus people who come to sport because of the movement stuff you just mentioned as a way of dealing with perhaps other social or mental health issues that they're, that they're having? We should be aware of both, I think. Um, and yeah, I think that's a really important distinction. Um, I personally don't know of research that's been able to distinguish those two yet, but I know that we have some really wonderful researchers on this call, and I don't know if Kelsey or Vanessa have any thoughts on that too, but I'll, I'm going to transition over, um, and I'm going to keep thinking on that and potentially get back to you in the chat on it, so thanks for bringing it up. Anyone else have any reflections on the causes of an eating disorder and the ways in which exercise and movement are linked, because I think that sets up why we're even here today is a really important, a really important endeavor. Um, but do you think we're all good as a group? <laughs> okay. If you're typing, I'll respond to you in the chat. But I think we've hopefully set up where does this initiative fit in? Where does Athletes Embodied fit in um, as something that we're creating? What's important is that both researchers um, at Western and U of T in this case and nonprofit organizations like Medic have really declared an urgent need for comprehensive and inclusive sports specific interventions that demonstrate a long-term reduction in body image concerns. And so we decided to embark in um, a two-pronged endeavor. One prong that Kelsey's gonna walk you through is a systematic review of body image interventions to try and answer the following questions. Um, how can we help mitigate the pressures around body shape, size, and appearance that greatly impact young girls? And how can we advance sports-specific body image promotion and eating disorder prevention strategies? Um, so you'll see that in the scoping. And then second, um, can we facilitate focus groups to really hear direct feedback from folks like you, um, stakeholders in youth sport, to get to figure out um, what are you hearing around these concerns and how can we be part of the change? And so I'm gonna turn it over to Kelsey to, to walk us through these things and you'll get to see me in the chat. Thanks, Ari. So as I start to go through some of these slides, it might become a bit of a numbers game uh, and sound like I'm just you know quantifying X, Y, Z, but these frequencies and their effects are really important to consider when we start to talk about future directions of the interventions and programs. So looking at the figure on the left, our systematic search of the literature yielded close to 1800 records. Uh, after removing duplicates, screening for eligibility and conducting full text reviews, 13 articles were identified. 
sorry, Ari, could you go back one slide? Yeah, thank you. Um, the included studies were published between 1996 and 2017, and the majority of the studies were conducted in the United States and Canada. Of the studies that were reported on unique participant groups, a total of 4,461 youth athletes completed the baseline data collection. The interventions included participants from high school sports, elite sports schools, competitive club sports, and even recreational sports. All studies reported an essential aim of educating or increasing eating disorder knowledge, preventing disordered eating behaviors, and or enhancing body image uh, indices in adolescent athletes. All interventions were delivered in the face-to-face -face format of group sessions. Five interventions reported the use of theoretical frameworks to inform the program development. And on average, the interventions occurred over approximately 21 weeks and included approximately five sessions. Uh, lastly, two interventions emphasized systemic change in the sport organization culture and conducted an environmental or systemic intervention versus a individual athlete specific intervention. Now, perhaps you're curious as to who was facilitating these interventions. And we ident uh, identified that uh, intervention facilitators included researchers, uh, coaches, peers, and even health and clinical professionals. Yet, interesting to note uh, is that the researcher facilitated interventions had the highest participants retention rate. Um, however, as I say that, we recognize that that might not be realistic in real sports settings. So looking at the coaches, uh, three interventions provided education to the coaches via a training manual or educational guideline. Additionally, three interventions also offered educational sessions for coaches and or the parents, as well as the organizational staff. Uh, so while all nine interventions provided some sort of educational lecture or informational workshops, there were a number of interventions that included supplementary methods to foster active learning and application of these new abilities, including activities and exercises, uh, workbooks and journals, videos, uh, and even social media. And it's important to note that the interventions that utilize these extra sort of supplementary intervention methods actually had a relatively high participant retention rate. Additionally, there were three interventions that noted using homework assignments or some sort of homework goal um, as a follow-up to the session topics. And these interventions also reported a high participant retention rate. Um, however, only two of these interventions included, uh, or sorry, reported significant reductions in disordered eating psychopathology. So, Considering uh, the interventions that were randomized uh, controlled trials with comparison or control groups, of these eight studies, six reported statistically significant reductions in disordered eating psychopathology or reductions in intentions to use restrictive dietary behaviors to lose weight. Uh, notably, these six studies that indicated uh, significant reductions between groups across time were both reported on only three distinct interventions. All three interventions were described as addressing topics relating to self-esteem, uh, body image, prevention of disordered eating, uh, nutrition, um, and were characterized by relatively um, high participant retention rates. So they appear to be really well-rounded educational interventions. However, these interventions were variable in intervention frequency, duration, and length of the session. Considering uh, the interventions that were non-randomized control trials, only one study was considered a non-randomized control trial with a control group and reported significant improvements in a number of outcomes. However, disordered eating behavior significantly increased in the intervention participants from pre-intervention to follow-up. So the mixed findings of the theoretically based intervention were accompanied by a moderate particip or participant retention rate, and it only targeted nutrition education. There were also three studies that were considered a non-randomized control trials with one single treatment arm. So there was no control or comparison group included. Uh, one reported significant decreases in disordered eating psychopathology and one study significantly increased participants' disordered eating knowledge from pre to post intervention. 
However, there was another study that revealed unfavorable findings and reported disordered eating patterns increased in participants over time. And I see a note in the comments, I know Ari already addressed it, but like I said, there's not obviously a lot of interventions that have been uh, conducted in this specific adolescent population before. So that's why we're seeing a very limited number of interventions. But going back to my notes here, so those interventions uh, that reported significant reductions or, inc or increased knowledge in disordered eating uh, were longer in uh, duration, um, provided similar session frequency, but were variable in the retention rates. Additionally, the two successful interventions were described at addressing body image, prevention of disordered eating, and nutrition, but there was no topic of self-esteem in the program. The less successful intervention was characterized by a long intervention duration and very low participant retention rates. So this intervention was also the only intervention to provide some sort of supplementary guideline to achieve healthy weight loss, uh, which may further highlight this, you know, this necessity to provide safe body image and disordered eating prevention resources and practices. So now let's chat about our stakeholders because I know there's a few on this webinar uh, call today. So to capture a range of the stakeholder perspectives, a total of 124 stakeholders were contacted from across Canada, including national, provincial, and local club level sport organizations, as well as government, education, and nonprofit uh, sport sectors. Uh, 59 representatives agreed to attend the meeting and 18 virtual focus groups were organized with mixed sport, uh, mixed sport system stakeholder groups. So overall, there was a considerable consensus that uh, there is a lack of body image resources available within their sport organization. And approximately 95% were unaware of any publicly available resources. Uh, there was also little knowledge about body image and eating disorders with most of the current understanding deriving from education on diet and nutrition, such as the NCCP Sport Nutrition Module or Obesity Canada, or even uh, Sport Nutritionist. As well, the stakeholder feedback generally uh, supported the designs and the methods of the interventions that were just previously discussed in the scoping review. Uh, so now at this time, I'd love to share some of the general perspectives and thoughts from the stakeholders in regards to uh, the identified intervention designs, the methods, and the materials that were used. I'm just gonna take a sip of water. So first off, in regards to the effective lesson planning, we asked our stakeholders in your sport organization, what has been used or what might be ideal as a lesson plan template? And if anyone who is interested in responding to these as I go about, please feel free because you know, we'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Um, so while a large proportion of stakeholders prefer an athlete specific program with multiple sessions compared to a single session or one-off material, 71% of stakeholders suggested that an effective plan or program would include the option to add sessions based on availability and identified need. We heard that the frequency of the sessions would be determined uh, with consideration of the time and the space that's available to the organization. Uh, we also heard from stakeholders as they stressed that the single session might not be enough to create any sort of meaningful change within uh, the organization. So to supplement the program, uh, stakeholders proposed that these one-off materials could be used to promote and educate their ed uh, organization on the program topics, and these could be included in their website or monthly newsletters. For our next question, we asked what facilitation methods have you used in your sport organization and might be or might be ideal for the proposed program. Uh, many suggested that the current uh, or that they currently use multiple uh, delivery methods. Um, you know, given that adolescent girls typically have different learning styles and a single modality might just be ineffective. So overall, approximately 70% of stakeholders recommended a blended learning environment where we use all of these uh, mediums. Um, and so these facilitation methods or this approach would be ideal for organizations with diverse sports training settings and requirements. 
think, sorry. For our next question, we ask, um, in your sport organization, who has facilitated your athletic program or who might be the ideal facilitator of the proposed program? 63% of stakeholders suggested that sessions should be coach facilitated with the option to involve current or alumni athlete peer leaders. Uh, stakeholders warned of the parents' involvement in the facilitation of the program and 78% uh, reiterated that parents and guardians should be provided with some sort of accurate information on body image and disordered eating. So this should, could come either from educational workshops or some sort of training for themselves. I decided to add these transitions in. <laughs> Sorry about that, Ari. <laughs> and then to build on the capacities of the coach facilitators, 36% of stakeholders suggested that coaches should be trained through a hybrid of uh, training medium. Evaluating the rankings of these Evaluating the, the rankings of these various training mediums uh, independently, training videos were given a higher ranking because of their consistency with the current national uh, training methods, whereas the training manual and the informational handouts could act to reinforce the educational videos. However, 25% of stakeholders indicated that training manuals should be avoided as the user might lose interest and not give the information the appropriate attention. Uh, as well, 63% of stakeholders felt that coaching training should be mandated and a standardized, asynchronous e-learning certification that's professionally endorsed from organizations such as NCCP, uh, Safe Sport Training, uh, Locker Training, or a professional development TV sort of setting are needed for topics of body image. Uh, so stakeholders suggested that a requirement to, or that there should be a requirement to complete coaching training could earn PD points within their NCCP uh, coaching pathway or otherwise be provided with a certificate of completion for their coaching transcript. <laughs> okay, so for any stakeholders that were involved in the focus group and that are with us today, they might remember this page uh, or this slide as they were asked to rank potential program topics. So these topics, again, were pulled from these past uh, interventions and program, and I'm, I've listed them here for you. As reported by our stakeholder representatives, um, the higher ranked topics were considered to be of greater importance to their organization or the least understood and discussed within their sport, uh, whereas the lower ranked topics were said to be frequently addressed in, um, within their sport, and so that's sort of why they were linked, uh, ranked last. Um, we often heard that this exercise was quite tough um, because all of these topics are valuable, but we were able to get some very strong ranking numbers from it. If you're able to read uh, the topics here, I know that there's a bit of a filter over the topics currently. Um, please feel free to respond in the chat, which you or what you feel would be a topic that would be the most important to discuss or uh, be included in a program like this. So feel free to share that in the chat. We'll give you a minute to do that. And it gives all of us a chance to water break while we do that too. Yes. So I'll just read them out here. I have healthy norms and pressures to be thin, eating disorder knowledge, physical activity, enjoyment and life balance, motivation and goal setting, nutrition knowledge, sports science, uh, self-esteem, and mindfulness and mental training. I'm getting a bunch of people confidentially messaging me on physical activity, enjoyment, and life balance as a it's a really high rank. Mm -hmm. Someone's now saying nutrition knowledge. Another person's self esteem. Mm -hmm. Someone sports science and self esteem, however, all are important. Smiley face. 
And so we definitely recognize that every sport organization might have a different need at this time. Um, so it would be our goal to obviously include or include a program that covers all of these topics. Um, however, in our focus group, overall, there was an agreement that physical activity, enjoyment, and life balance should be the central tenet of the program. And 36% of stakeholders ranked this topic first. So these, this could also include um, topics around promoting activity and sport for fun, balance between sport and life, and developing a healthy identity with sport. We then saw that the topic of self-esteem was ranked second. So this could include factors that affect your self-esteem, promoting body acceptance and self-confidence, and helping participants to develop positive self-concept or positive concept of self. We then saw healthy norms and pressures to be thin ranked third. Yes. So this topic could include comparing different types of body ideals, evaluating media influences and exploring eating attitudes and beliefs about food, uh, exercise, weight, and shape. Mindfulness and mental training was ranked fourth. And this might include stress management, problem solving skills, uh, coping skills, self-talk, mindful practices, and self-compassion training. For our fifth, we saw nutrition. Yes, nutrition knowledge. Uh, so this could include the topics of you know, the role of carbs, proteins, and fats, liquid needs, uh, growth and development, and using a positive approach to food. We then saw eating disorder knowledge rank six, which could include information on the female athlete triad. I recognize though that this is now red. I pulled the female athlete triad from these previous interventions, but that would be updated, of course. Uh, etiology of eating disorders, biological, physiological, psychological factors, and treatment options ranked um, seventh, I guess we're at, yes. Motivation and goal setting was ranked seventh. So this could include how to set up goals, evaluating your goals, and synchronizing goals with your coach. And then sports science was considered a topic that was most discussed in most sport organizations. So uh, this was why it was sort of ranked last, but it, or it could include topics relating to training principles, injury and uh, prevention knowledge, um, and how to develop healthy activity habits. So this is always a fun exercise and it's really interesting to hear, or was really interesting to hear at that time, um, what the stakeholders were sort of needing from a program like this. So we also asked uh, stakeholders on which level of the organization should be championing this type of program. And of the 32% uh, percent of stakeholders that actually commented on the program approach, 74% of stakeholders agreed that the proposed program would obtain the most support by following a top-down approach. So this is described as achieving support through national uh, sport bodies followed into the provincial sport sections or sport uh, sectors where that might be promoted into the clubs and more grassroots levels. Conversely, 21% 21, <laughs> 21 felt that the provincial sport bodies have the greater power to mandate and deliver a program to the club and grassroots uh, facilitators. And it was thought that once the momentum is sort of gained at these lower levels, that it would push change all the way to the top of the organization. With regard to the themes and observed barriers um, that might hinder uh, organizational implementation, buy-in from all um, Buy-in from all organizational levels appears to be the main barrier among 24% of stakeholder groups. Uh, a secondary theme related to perceived barriers of implementation involves the limited capacity of the sport organizations and their coaches, including limited time, staffing, and the current demands of all other required coaching training. Other barriers of implementation related to the avoidance of the topic and normalizing the conversation in the sport. Uh, the gender specific nature of the proposed curriculum in co-gender sports and the current sport culture and any sort of denial uh, or denial of any sort of issue in their sport. Lastly, there were three major themes uh, that were identified regarding the factors and trends that might influence the implementation of any future body image and programs and resources. First, 25% of stakeholders emphasized that the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on their sports 
and needing to adapt to these environmental changes. So some stakeholders express uh, that their current priorities are just a return to sport, uh, and therefore immediate attention must, might not be given to the resources that address body image in sport, as well the new online learning environment created by the COVID-19 pandemic must also be considered for successful dissemination and implementation of the program and its resources. Um, additionally, 24% of stakeholders identified similarities between uh, the current sort of national safe sport programming. So given the large spotlight that's been placed on safe sport training for coaches, stakeholder representatives indicated that buy-in might be achieved if the proposed program were cushioned into national sport or national safe sport uh, programming. Uh, lastly, 12% of stakeholders highlighted other movements uh, for social justice within their sport organization and expressed that the limited capacity for their organization to take on another initiative. Others felt that the heightened public attention that's been placed on these other social justice issues could help to uh, catapult uh, the topics of body image and disordered eating within adolescent girls into uh, the limelight. Um, but that's just something for us to consider with a program like this. There were also some other factors uh, that were brought up about um, what specifically could be influencing implementation of a program like this. And uh, one of those was that individuals felt that this type of programming would fit really nicely into a high school PE curriculum. And others felt that the current mental health or mental health status of coaches um, might be limited. Uh, there were a few stakeholders that sort of mentioned that coaches are stressed, they're burnt out, and uh, really just questioned if they had the mental capacity to take on such a, um, what they sort of described as a heavy topic. Thanks, Ari. So let's discuss these findings. Um, there's a lot there, and especially for anyone who got to participate in, in those focus groups, um, I'm sure there's even extra to stew on as we all discussed that in our groups, and we were always wondering what, what the other folks might have said. And for those of you who are new to this conversation, um, I think there's a lot there to unpack too. Um, I'm having some conversations with folks in the chat on the ways in which, for example, um, there's an online environment and people are now kind of burnt out of online. And I think like hybrid as a word is being thrown around a lot, but I don't know if we've, as a sector yet, really unpacked um, what that looked like. And so I think there's been some really nice indicators from, from the results from um, the both the scoping review and the focus groups. And so we have pulled out some questions that we're still thinking about that we'd love to give all of you an opportunity to chime in on in the chat should you like to. And so here are two from the scoping review. Um, one, there appears to be no clear pattern of results favoring any one particular method of delivering programming, and greater clarity is really needed on the functional components of those interventions because in some cases there aren't that many of them, and in others the circumstances have changed. Um, we think as program planners that we maybe want to consider some of the practice-based evidence that you all are engaging in right now and the practical circumstances in which we'd be delivering the program. So. What we'd love to ask all of you to chime in on in the chat is any of these three questions. Um, what lessons have you learned from delivering programs? What has been effective? And what policy, regulatory, or organizational shifts have already started to happen? And so we're gonna give this a few minutes here to, to let you stew on this in the chat and we'll read out some answers from folks. And please know that you can message myself or Kelsey confidentially if you feel like you want us to read out something from you. Um, without your name attached. So we have someone in the chat that's already agreeing, at least po policy-wise, that safe sport can and should be expanded and positioned as an overarching program that includes things like body image or maltreatment of athletes, REDS, concussion prevention, et cetera, and the ways these things intersect. Thanks for bringing that up. Anyone else with thoughts? Someone's mentioning with respect to delivery must be a combination of formats. Virtual is good, 
but in-person provides much more engagement and social connection. So it might depend on the goal or objective of a particular activity that we're doing. Thanks for bringing that up. Someone's mentioning a concern around the, the burden placed on coaches. They say to them, it's so important to provide coaches with resources. And I think it's unfair to expect them to educate athletes and parent groups directly. Um, yeah, it was definitely something that came to all of our minds as we stewed on the 63%, the 64% agreement on, on a coach-led program, um, both on they're a really key adult influencer. And we know that many in the volunteer basis are, are burdened with a lot too. Someone saying, I'm unsure on the most effective delivery style, though small groups with open-minded and compassionate facilitators seem to be effective in my experience. That could be online or in person. So really speaking to maybe the qualities of the facilitator as being really key. Um, there's a little bit of agreement in the chat on Zoom fatigue coming and going in waves. Um, if the topic and content is strong, though it will connect, but timing is important to getting people on board. Someone else has learned, I've learned that organizations and program attendees like cost-effective programs. I understand that hybrid models might be preferable, but I always wonder about costs related to facility renting or housing the programs. I'm also concerned about reaching individuals in remote areas who cannot travel to that in-person aspect of the program. Yeah, and the accessibility piece is something we've seen a lot in the, on the healthcare side at Medic, um, just the amount of extra folks now who feel more comfortable with online methods of support and reaching out or being connected to online support groups or things like that if they are having issues. And I think there's also merit to that on a prevention side to reach people who can't really drive for an hour or two after, after work or after a long day or parents who have to do that for their kids. Someone else is saying cost is a factor. Example, e-learning series with three to four modules are free versus final module being paid. People go for free and even if they're paid one, maybe you could make that connected to the NCCP pathway or something like that as incentive. Um, yeah, it's nice to get to learn from these practices from folks. Okay, feel free if anyone's typing or moving, but you don't, we don't have to be done. If you're typing, we'll still read your thing out. Um, moving on to some discussion points around coaches in the sport environment, because I, I hear it coming up. Um, from the coaches who were able to participate with, with us in these focus groups, some, some reported that little confidence in initiating those conversations around body image. Um, some are worried about harm and some are like worried about harming actively and some are worried about harming passively, like from the lack of action. Sometimes we only focus on active harm when someone screws up as opposed to the harm that results from inaction. And both of those things are really important. Um, organizations really spoke about relying predominantly on volunteer coaches, especially as you got more down to the grassroots level. And many of them have very little training in their sport even and effective practices, let alone things around mental health topics. Um, ultimately, there seemed to be some agreement around train the trainer models um, and really taking use of existing, taking advantage, sorry, of existing structures like the NCCP to garner that top-down ownership and accountability. Um, so you can see that bubble there on the very right. And finally, um, folks, I think we're really, um, unanimous, as you saw at the very beginning, that 95% of folks not really knowing of existing body image resources or wanting more of them, um, providing those body image resources at multiple levels of the sport organization. So not just to athletes and parents, but also to administration and management, to referees, multiple folks brought up referees and, and, and judges and assessors, um, to really target changes at multiple levels of the environment. And that's where you see that that graphic come up. Anyone have any thoughts as they reflect on, on, these, um, on these points?
someone sharing, I don't want to lose sight of the need coaches have to have resources at their fingertips. So they know what to do if the coach suspects that an athlete is struggling more on the, on the disordered eating end. I.e., once the coach suspects there's an issue, now what do they do? Yeah, I hope that one lesson from today, at least later on, is we'll show you our, our netic helpline hours and stuff and the ways in which we exist as an agency to maybe be that in the moment support for the coach or an athlete and to help with that connection of resources. So we'll explain that in a minute or two. Is anyone surprised by any of, of these reflections so far? And if they do, they can note that. We have one more slide of reflections. A lot of folks messaging confidentially saying, um, some some surprised at least at the the rankings that that's the way it played out but also some being like nope like that sounds like where we, i thought it would be um, so i'm seeing a bit of a mix at least from the folks messaging me kelsey you getting anything in your chat okay okay someone's mes messaging and i'll move on to the next slide after this I'm wondering about the practicalities of having coaches facilitate these types of nuanced and challenging conversations. You referenced this, but interventions like this are so hard to implement effectively. And I wonder if other folks are required, like skilled therapists or other, otherwise. Um, Kelsey noted that a little bit in the scoping re review results on the ways in which some interventions had higher retention than others. And the ways in which I think when we're thinking from a population health side, I think everyone goes coaches, right? Like they're the ones connecting with their athletes. Their words are often mattering in many ways for their mental health, for their performance, for other things. Um, and, and I hear that need around like some of these conversations, especially as we get more and more to the like clinical side can be really difficult. And um, one thing that's really important to emphasize here is the, um, we're wanting to really prevent disordered eating from happening in the first place. And so when we're thinking about an intervention like this, it's around body image writ large and how do we reach as many people as possible while also giving coaches and athletes and sport organizations tools for like when you are noticing, what can you do? Um, and I think we'll have to balance both of those things. Some of that already exists on the clinical side, but not so much as, as Kelsey's shared with us nicely on the prevention side. Um, Lastly, on the curriculum topics, before we move on, um, just to really emphasize that physical activity, enjoyment, and life balance ranked first. Um, and some of the things that came up around that were really encouraging athletes to view sports as a lifetime pursuit, which includes caring for their bodies over time, encouraging flexibility in scheduling workouts and training sessions, and encouraging athletes to strive for balance between sport and other areas of their life. Those were kind of like the qualitative themes that come out. Um, Stakeholders from some of our more aesthetic sports ranked topics like healthy norms and the pressure to be thin and eating disorder knowledge with a greater level of importance. And representatives from non-aesthetic sports had mindfulness and mental training and nutrition knowledge is higher. So there is a little bit of difference, even though there is general agreement on the range here. Um, and I think we've had a chance to, to reflect on these curriculum topics um, as a group. So without further ado, I think I'm going to turn over to Vanessa to talk us through um, where we are as an uh, as initiative moving forward. Awesome. Thank you, Ari. So we have some exciting news. We have created a website with all of this information called Athletes Embodied. Ari, do you want to just switch to the website slide? Awesome. So our website will be evolving in many different ways as we continue to work through this research and fill the gap in body image and eating attitudes in sport. Here you'll find more information on why we started this project, the impact we hope to have, a spot for our future programming and educational body image content. The first step you can make today is uh, sign up on our homepage, you will see that there is a monthly newsletter sign up option. And here you can type in your email address and we'll add you to our monthly newsletter mailing list. We promise we won't spam your inbox. Um, 
On our website, you'll also find a section for this webinar in case you would like to rewatch and share with your family, friends, athletes, coaches, or anyone you think would be interested in this research. We hope to also have future workshops and presentations open for all of you in the months to come. And if you are curious about this work, you should check out our resources tab with related publications and some terms to help you learn more about body image and eating disorders. Um, and also, we're very excited to introduce an ambassador program. So this program will continue to evolve. However, right now our hope is to get some like-minded athletes who feel that athletes and body should be incorporated into all sporting contexts. So we are asking you to check out this tab and then email us with your story and anything you would want to tell the world about your experiences and what makes you feel empowered in sport. We want to hear from you. So together as a team, we hope to conduct ongoing research with our athletes to create a more enjoyable and inclusive sporting atmosphere for the years to come and showcase every body is a sport body. In our contact us section, you will find all of Netic's contact information and the contact information for the body image and health research lab. Some of the things that we think are potential strengths from our, um, of our work is the inclusion of stakeholders across all steps of the protocol. And we hope that through seeing this website in the ways that we want you to continue to stay engaged, that we want to continue to engage you in all the steps that we're doing. Um, we really see this as a partnership between research and practice. Um, and Netic and the folks at Western and U of T have already started to engage in that on the, on the mental health side and in the project creation side to really ensure that we have a safety net around risk around those athletes who we think are more affected, even though our goal is prevention. Um, we think there's a really clear need for this program in girls sport and this proposed program we think has the capacity to fulfill several knowledge gaps and support the need for body image resources across sport. What we think we'd like to continue to do grow, going forward is to continue to involve all of you directly in the work to really meet that buy-in challenge that was at the top of the challenges list that Kelsey walked us through. Um, to really continue to combat that in many sports that body weight or aesthetic appearance fit are still considered central to athletic success, even though um, that conversation is starting to shift with things like safe sport and COVID-19 pandemic really bringing mental health more and more up onto our radar. We really are hopeful to, to ride that momentum. So like Vanessa mentioned, don't hesitate to go to that um, site that I've linked into the chat um, to take a list to take a peek at our sign up list to stay involved um, to see what learning opportunities we have going forward and to contact us if you want to learn more this is a live site so these resources will continue to be up to date and if you have resources that you think should be linked here for other folks like your colleagues in other sports um, please contact us and send them to us we're happy to to cross post and have that there As we wrap up, um, we just like to acknowledge and thank our funders at the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council and the MyTax Accelerate program um, and our collaborators um, at BIH and MPARC um, for all of this work. Um, know that in the slide deck that you all are gonna get a copy of, that there's a resources page that will include some things for you to listen and read to and um, that our helpline is always here. Um, so if you want to call us on the telephone or chat in on instant chat, um, we are open seven days a week to be able to really help out those folks who you think are struggling with this more as we work towards this goal of prevention. Um, so otherwise, without further ado, um, we're going to hang tight here just in case the folks have questions, but we're going to pop the stop the recording now. Um, and we hope to see you again at a future webinar. Thank you. Thank you.